And so, first of all, thank you all for, for coming. Uh, this is uh, a thing we're trying for the first time, but uh, basically an opportunity to, when we notice folks have given for the first time or given recently, for us to reach out and introduce ourselves a bit better and answer any questions. And so, we've got a, a deck here that we will blow through pretty quickly, um, just to give you guys a sort of sense of the landscape. Um, and then we'll want to, we will intentionally do that pretty quickly because we're hoping to have some time for questions as well. Uh, by way of introduction, my name is Joe Houston and I'm uh, Give Directly's Managing Director. Uh, before that hat, I've worn a handful of different hats with Give Directly, starting out in Kenya um, as our field director and then moving to Uganda and uh, I have filled a few different positions and so uh, have really gotten to see Give Directly from a number of different angles and am excited to share that with you. And then also joining me is my colleague, Stephen, whom I'll, I'll let introduce himself. Yeah, hey everyone, uh, Stephen Kalunga is my name. I'm the senior manager of Programs Kenya. Uh, sorry, I have a cold, but we should be able to take this through. I've been with the Give Directly over the, the last four years. Um, welcome all. Great. And so I, I will start with the kind of setting the, the, the sort of what's the problem we're trying to solve. Um, and so, as you all know, give directly, we give money to people who need it. And the kind of animating reason behind that is we want to help end extreme poverty. And the good news behind that is that people living in extreme poverty have been uh, exiting uh, exiting poverty themselves over the last several decades. That that's one of the sort of most positive news stories over the last several decades is that uh, extreme poverty has fallen quite a bit. And uh, as a result, the cost uh, of ending or, or sort of the, the sum of everybody's gap uh, between the, the amount they live on today and the poverty line, if you try to add that all up across uh, all the days in a year and all the people living below extreme poverty, that's this uh, purple line, sort of cost of closing the poverty gap. And that's been declining rapidly over time uh, to today being about sort of 70, $80 billion a year. Uh, the bad news of, about COVID is that for the first year in a long time, it, it upticked uh, and uh, more people went into poverty as a result of COVID. But the kind of broader secular story is still true that we've made massive, massive progress. In particular, people living in extreme poverty have made massive, massive progress in getting themselves out of poverty over the last several decades. Um, and what that gives us to now is a tantalizing opportunity that, if you, again, if you added up the differences uh, that between each person and the poverty line, uh, the cost of closing that poverty line is now less than the amount we're spending globally just in government aid, official development assistance. Um, and so the poverty gap is about $75 billion a year and official de development assistance is at sort of 150 or so a year. Um, and it's small relative to other resources we have as well that you know, if you took 1% of, of US and, and uh, European GDP, that would generate about $400 billion a year. And so there's this real tantalizing opportunity to help accelerate the exits that people in, living in poverty are already making. Um, the question though is, is how do we do that? Um, and, and so the next slide shows uh, the sector uh, that we've built collectively, which is complicated. That you have uh, resources on one end, uh, different types of donors, individuals or institutional and things like that. And then typically that they're trying to help somebody on the other end through a web of different types of intermediaries. To, you know, whether that's UN multilateral organizations or big NGOs who are then subgranting to other NGOs, who are then subgranting to subsidiaries, who are then subgranting to local partners. And partly this is just complicated. Uh, partly each way, each step along the way, you lose a bit of money. But each sort of organization is taking a cut. Um, and then in addition to sort of money decreasing or sort of the value decreasing over time. Uh, agency is also decreasing, but these gifts get kind of increasingly constrained and restricted over time. So at the end, what the recipient is receiving is less value than what the donor put in at the beginning, and that value typically comes with a lot of strings attached. And there may sometimes be good reasons for those strings. There are things we've figured out, uh, highly specialized medical interventions and things like that, where you really do want to 
deliver something highly specific. Uh, but a lot of those strings exist just from inertia or from paternalist, paternalism that doesn't match the evidence we have on uh, the sort of decision-making abilities of, of the sort of end person we're trying to help. And, and, and so that's the kind of existing sector today. And as you all know, what we're trying to do some, is something radically different, which is uh, take, take a budget uh, that exists with a person or with an organization and hand it over uh, to the person we're trying to help. And again, that's not going to be the answer for everything. It won't always be the case that the person we're trying to help has uh, a, a sort of better sense of how to spend that budget. There may be information asymmetries. There may be public goods that you'd want to invest in. Uh, but we want this to be a kind of default assumption that rather than sort of me sitting in New York or a, a donor sitting in DC or London making all the decisions, that we should put much, much more decision-making power into the hands of the people we're trying to help. And a nice byproduct of that is that it'll also be much more efficient, um, that basically you know, 80, 90% of the budget is reaching their hands versus a, a, a much smaller amount. And so th this gives you a sense of uh, some of the kind of many things uh, that people will spend money on. Uh, the best thing about cash transfers is it enables choice. Uh, and because people are so different, the choices they make are also often different. Um, I've met somebody who uh, was a musician and used the funds to buy instruments and started a band and then sort of toured around the local area in, in Western Kenya. Um, but you can see a bunch of other things here. Uh, some of the themes are different types of improvement in people's lives, whether it's making their house a bit more comfortable. Uh, investing in a mattress or something like that, investing in livestock or their farm or a thousand different small businesses. And walking around a community where we're giving cash is, is fun because you get to see just how many different types of ideas and plans people, people have uh, and, and how many they can sort of put to good use with a bit of money. Uh, undergirding all of this is technology. And so we got started in, in part because mobile money, uh, effectively Venmo or PayPal, but with uh, agents all over willing to exchange the digital balance for a physical balance. We got started because mobile money made cash transfers much more efficient and much more secure. Uh, but, but every step of our, of our process uses technology from choosing the places, or in some cases, the people that we're, we're trying to serve uh, signing people up through digital surveys, paying them through digital payments, and then monitoring through through call centers and, and, and text-based follow-up. Uh, I don't want to give the impression that giving cash is easy, that uh, the, the work that Stephen and we do operationally to give people a good experience, uh, ensure that there isn't fraud in any part of our process, uh, all of that takes a ton of different types of work. And so, uh, and, and it's, it's a real advantage of GiveDirectly being vertically integrated that all of this work is happening within our team, which today is about uh, 600 people, uh, almost all of those living in the places where we're delivering cash. And so these are a number of the kind of different challenges you might imagine would ha come from going door to door and handing out cash. And, and, and these are some of the things we, we, we do to, to mitigate those challenges. I did want to touch on the evidence behind cash transfers because there's the kind of agency and human dignity story, which is important. There's the financial story about just how do we efficiently deliver the most resources to the people we're trying to help and how can cash be a kind of an efficient mechanism for that. And then there's an evidence story about uh, that goes pretty simply that cash transfers have been studied just about as much or more than any other development intervention out there. Uh, it's especially done by, by governments, uh, but nonprofits are also doing it. And we've tested a number of different questions about cash transfers. And so if you go to our website, there's a place where you can explore the kind of 300 plus rigorous studies that have looked at the effects of cash transfers. Um, and we've also tried to summarize uh, the effects on, on, on our website as well. Uh, but the themes you see are pretty consistent that uh, if you get cash to people who need it, they spend it on things they need. And so you see a wide variety of positive outcomes, first on the kind of poor monetary poverty side, and then on some of those sort of more secondary outcomes that affect quality of life as people 
put the more money towards different things that prioritize. Um, and then on the flip side, what you don't see are the kind of things people are most frequently worried about with cash transfers. Uh, they don't spend it on tobacco or alcohol. In fact, uh, the sort of studies measuring those things show, if anything, a decrease in, in, in temptation goods. Uh, the only folks who work less uh, when receiving cash are children, uh, that if you give adults to people living in extreme poverty, uh, give cash transfers to adults living in extreme poverty, they typically work the same amount as they did before or they work less. Um, and then you see these sort of psychosocial effects as well with people uh, fighting less, uh, less conflict, less sexual abuse within families and uh, people less stressed, committing suicide less frequently and measurably less depressed. And so this is a kind of intuitive finding that has been studied over and over again all over the world uh, with pretty consistent results. Um, and this is, uh, in, in addition to that evidence body sort of existing out there, GiveDirectly is actively contributing to it. And so in parallel to us delivering cash each year, we're running all sorts of different types of randomized control trials and other rigorous studies to, to measure the effects of cash transfers. And so we've got about 15 ongoing. And then uh, this is, these are the results from one of the studies we've done that found from giving large one-time grants to folks you saw big increases in assets, big increases in spending on food, measurable reductions in stress, and, and big increases in earnings as well. And with now, I'll hand it over to Stephen to give you some insight on how our, our Kenya program is doing today. Yeah, that, thanks, Joe. And in terms of uh, the, the way the employment process uh, runs, um, the employment process, um, we, we have some key operational performance indicators that usually measure our success against. And these ones from the entrollment side are majorly the numbers, the absolute numbers that were enrolled. And we have these ones uh, usually specified at week level and also at monthly level. And then other ones a beneficiary has been enrolled, now they are ready to start receiving uh, transfers. And then we also measure um, their customer experience. And for us to do this, we have a 12 hour um, um, six day call center that sits in Nairobi. And then um, through the calls, um, the recipients are able to do a free call that is via outline call. And we also do callbacks. And for the callbacks, either can be from the people who called and they were not able to get us, and also to administer them the follow up service. And also, when you are looking at um, the call center performance at the same time, we are also looking at adverse events. And this one is uh, closely related to the challenges that Joe just mentioned um, that come when it comes to, uh, to running cash transfers. All our metrics um, for the concern in terms of calls um, and also in terms of the actual employment numbers, we give ourselves a performance indicator of above 90% each and every month. And then for the cases, like if somebody reports that um, there was a misunderstanding also as a result of our transfer, we automatically open a case for that also by the consent. And the cases we give ourselves uh, less than 30 days uh, for us to be able to resolve uh, those cases there. The resolving can include um, continuing the transfers, posting the transfers and continue engaging the local authorities and also directly with the household to be able to, to solve these issues. And then in terms of other key demographic information of interest, we also check in terms of what is the age of the beneficiaries that we are reaching. And as you can see from our graph there, you can see that majority are between the ages of 21 and 60, where is where you will expect um, majority of the households to be. And then we also track very keenly what is the language of administration of the service, because that one ties uh, to the outline and also the customer experience that we do. And then the other thing we also track gender uh, for us to be able to understand like who we are reaching. And one of the good interesting things is that um, all through uh, consistent across all our projects that are rolled out at household level. We have noted that um, majority of our recipients are the women. And also when you go and you find even the, um, the male spouse there, and you give the household a choice to be able to select who should receive the money, they always nominate them, they always nominate the females, which is our, which is an interesting thing. Uh, specifically in terms of uh, absolute numbers and throughout this month, for this month alone, we have committed 1.4 million uh, USD. And that is to about uh, for 201 uh, families 
with our maximum throughput per month uh, being around 2,000 um, households. And each of these households is going to receive the 1K um, USD uh, transfer amount in two batches. Next slide. Now, um, that, that, that's the map there just shows um, which are the areas that we are currently active in operations. And um, we are um, on the Western side of, of Kenya in a county that is very close, um, a county that is very close to the Western side of Kenya called Bomet, and also along the, um, the coastal region of Kenya that is to the, south, um, to the south of the map of Kenya. And in terms of the numbers that we have been able to reach in terms of the global statistics, as we speak today, um, in excess of 60,000 um, beneficiaries have received the cash from us, um, which uh, totals to around 63.5 um, USD million um, have been delivered across the same, same period. And also specifically, we had already talked about the number that we have been able to enter this month. And you can already see in terms of how this, that spirit looks like across the two regions. And the big determiner for this is more on the staffing sizes that we have across the two regions. Good to note that um, the numbers that we are presenting here, they are only for our lump sum um, projects and then um, the, um, the huge amounts of recipients that we enrolled uh, through a COVID uh, project last year are not captured yet. And uh, next slide. And then um, for them, so we have a 1.5 minute video here. And then um, we, we have one of the beneficiaries that was enrolled uh, this month and speaking through what they intend to do with them um, with the transfers. We do much of this, and so you should be on the lookout uh, to get more of these kind of stories. Thank you. Kwa machina na ito agifuwa hiko skejo vre, natoka Bomet County, Chevalong Constituency, Secret Division. Kaboso on location, BGG Akiptendan Village. So, asante kwa kiftare kwa amekucha hapa kwangu, kwa ameona vile maisha inaendelea. So, ameona hii nyumba angu vile ya matope. So, mfuwa ikinyesha, hii matope yote inanguka jine. So, matope ikianguka, paridi inaingia ndani. So, inasumbua watoto kwa oma, watoto wanapata shida baridi, ala winaleta shida kwa watoto. Laini vile maona kiftare kwa amekucha, Nataanza kupadlisha hii nyumba kuchenga ya maa, sabu hii pesa ni mwona, hii pesa wa metupea, ni pesa mzuri. So hata ni meanta kuleta maa, mawe ndio hii, ni meanta kuleta mawe, mawe ndio hii, ni mesha aleta, ni mesha aleta hii mawe. So, ile tu kipta rego wa mempea hii pesa, wa kinipea hitu hii pesa, ni ante kuleta tu kitu singine kama mabati, alavu ni ante kutarisha mampea fundi, alavu tuendele na kazi. So mambo mambo singine tena ye ni meona kiftare watatusaidia tangi yangu ya kuchota maji ni hiki. So mi inategea maji hii tangi tupe keake. La ni meona hii pesa ya kiftare kwa kinepea. Tanunua tangi kubwa. Alawo nitaanta kutega maji mfua ikinyesha. Itaingia ndani. So nitasaidia bibi sao bibi sa zingine anaenda huko mtoni sa huko nimbali. So akiendea maji ya tajukua muda. Patole ya kuendeleza mambo ya piyashara hake. So ni kinunua tangi ya ipe ya kip direct, tawana inanisaidia. So kip direct asandeni sana, umekucha kwangu, umeakalia maisha file inandele, asandeni sana. Karibuni. I do want to keep my promise to uh, to leave time for questions, and so I'll go through these quickly. Uh, these are some of the things we're focusing on this year. If you could bucket them, it's probably how do we reach more people uh, you know, in different types of need more quickly, more efficiently, and provide a better level of service. And then how can we connect the sort of two communities we're working with, uh, folks providing funds and folks receiving them, uh, so we can almost sort of disintermediate, give directly further. And I think there's financial aspects of that, and then there's also more emotional ones around how can we uh, let the folks receiving the money make the case versus, uh, versus uh, us. Uh, an early question we often get is, is, is how can I help beyond just sort of giving? And so uh, one option is to launch a fundraiser. Uh, in general, getting out and talking about giving is the answer for a lot of these things. And a fundraiser for a birthday or an event or something like that is often uh, an easy way to do that. You can organize a talk. We'll, we'll come sort of share what we do and talk about the evidence around cash transfers with uh, folks at your organization. You can also share something you've read and, and, and spark the conversation that way. 
Uh, and then we are always hiring quite a bit. And so if you know somebody uh, you've worked with uh, or you yourself uh, who'd be great for a job we have, we'd love to, to have you. And with that, uh, I'll open it up for, for questions. And so people can throw any questions they have into the chat and uh, we'll get to as many as we can. So one question we got is, uh, how do people, how does Git directly reach people who don't have phone access? Um, Steven, can I toss that one to you? Yeah, um, very true, um, very true, Joe. The, the point is more on what is the determining factor for that? So that is the first thing that we established. So if it is a household, and let's say it's an issue to rural vulnerability. What we do is that for those households, you appoint a trustee who receives money on behalf of them on behalf of the household. Go. Yeah, and so there's a few different ways that a household could not have phone access if they you know don't have a phone at all, but know how to use it or can learn quickly. Uh, we will offer them a phone and just deduct it deduct it from their transfer. And a lot of folks take us up on that offer. Uh, if they don't have a phone and they don't know how to use it, uh, then we find somebody in their community to help them. Ideally, a trusted family member or something like that, but somebody that the recipient, you know, trusts uh, uh, to kind of interface with us on, on, on phone access. Um, and if it's something sort of more macro, like they don't, you know, there's no cell coverage or something like that, uh, we've worked with, with uh, telco providers to kind of tell them about dead spots and often where we're working because we're sort of creating so much business on the mobile money side, they're often sort of responsive to that. And then recipients themselves know a lot about the kind of local network coverage. And so they'll go to the you know nearest hill or something like that where they can get service uh, or, or, or get coverage. Um, we've got another question about what are some of your major hurdles to fundraising or increasing funds? Um, I, I think a big piece of it is uh, connecting people to the impact of incremental dollars. Uh, uh, and, and this gets to the kind of third priority I, I, I mentioned about how do we kind of connect uh, donors and recipients better is that a question I get still get too often is, oh, well, give directly is growing. Does my donation have the same impact? Um, and asking that makes sense if you think of the donation as primarily to give directly, um, but it doesn't make sense as much if it's through give directly to folks living in extreme poverty where each dollar obviously matters quite a bit. Um, and so I do think there's a core communication challenge that give directly has to crack um, both with individual donors and with institutional donors uh, uh, to sort of make that impact, especially of sort of incremental giving much, much more clear. Um, and, and then I think broadly that there's a, uh, there, there's all sorts of challenges around funders coming with specific interests or specific ideas about where they'd like to see money go. Um, and that that's completely at odds with, with, with cash transfers. And so I, I think trying to navigate that it, it is often something uh, that, you know, especially earlier on can, can slow down fundraising. And I think um, even when people are sort of coming with a, a relative, relatively open mind, uh, opening that further or just highlighting all of the sort of neat ideas like the person we just watched has uh, to sort of widen the kind of willingness or aperture uh, 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 of donors to, to kind of release control. Um, and then we had a question about what's the kind of, uh, the question is, if I understood correctly, you, you mentioned that cash donations had a long-term impact on people's future income. What is the determining factor on this? Uh, I, I think the determining factor is where do people 
where do people spend? You know, that's always going to be the mechanism. And I think for long term effects as well, the questions are going to be, do they invest in, in, in something that's going to spin off longer term income increases? And so examples of that could be, you know, livestock or farm investments, investments in a business, also more subtle investments that, you know, I think sometimes the kind of best long term investment people have is uh, adequate nutrition for their kids or things like that. Um, or, or, you know, investments in education. And so the question of, you know, does a particular program have long-term effects for cash transfers will, will always be ultimately up to the folks we're, we're getting the cash to and, and, and where they put the money and what their priorities are. Um, but you, you do see programs that have, you know, pick up these types of long-term effects, uh, which reflects, uh, that, that you're able to kind of find people who have priorities and plans uh, that will have that kind of longer term, longer term impact. Already, I think that's everything. And so I'll throw, oh, I, one more question. Have you encountered corruption or interference issues from local governments or others? Uh, yes, uh, I, I'd, I'd put that in the category of like pretty frequent challenges that we have to navigate. And, and I think the reasons run the gamut from sort of more direct, somebody hoping to get a cut to, you know, suspicion of uh, a new foreign nonprofit coming to an to an area or something like that. And so, um, typically, depending on the sort of reasons for interference or, or resistance from from local government, we'll have different types of responses. Uh, on kind of corruption, you know, part of the kind of goal of the call center we have and the internal audit team we have is to detect that and deter it and report it uh, potentially up the chain uh, with the sort of superiors in local government or national government, or at the very least communicate directly to recipients if they don't have to pay a bribe or something like that. Um, on other types of, you know, obstruction, it's often just about getting good at introducing ourselves and explaining our program, showing the evidence, taking them to, to meet folks who've received cash. Um, and, and, and so we've sort of encountered all, all sorts of different types and depending on the reason, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll respond uh, in kind. Um, I know we're a, a little over time, and I think those are all of our questions. If anybody else has questions, I'm Joe at givedirectly.org. Steven should be stephen.kalungu at givedirectly.org. Uh, please reach out with it, any questions that, that cross your mind uh, or uh, ideas for, for how we can help. Uh, and yeah, th thanks for joining uh, this, uh, this first experimental session with us. Uh, please let, let us know also if you have any feedback on, on how, how we approach this and uh, the information we delivered. Thank you.